Nora Denzel, and um, I started out in 1984 as a software engineer for the IBM company. And throughout the last 25 plus years, I've risen to the role of executive technical management. And my last role was at Intuit, which is a $4 billion software company, and I was heading its big data, social product design, and marketing. Um, and then on my 50th birthday, I decided that I would retire, which was three months ago. And now I'm serving on technology boards, corporate boards for public companies, as well as startups in the Silicon Valley. You know, with 28 years behind me, I think, you know, some of the biggest lessons are um, the number one thing that successful people say um, was what helped with their success above everything else. So they ask successful people, was it your education, was it your training, was it your hometown, your family, your parents? The number one thing they say is attitude, and I 100% believe that. When, once you change your attitude um, toward you know, optimism as well as you know, realism, um, your career starts to soar. So I really believe that, and the data also shows it. Sure, one of the things I told women is they have to feel comfortable being uncomfortable. And it's really funny, having managed people for the last 15 years, somehow men don't feel uncomfortable when they're in a new area or they have a lot of confidence that they can do something that they've never done. And women, for some reason, even though they're incredibly competent, once they feel uncomfortable, they start to worry that they're a failure and they must go back to whatever it is they came from. So we talked a lot about just feeling comfortable being uncomfortable and learning how to act, act as if you're confident um, and act as if you know, whatever you're doing, you've done before. Um, somehow men don't have that problem, but women will show that they're unconfident, and then people don't really want to invest in them or follow them. And so you must be confident, and the way you do it is act confident and feel comfortable being uncomfortable. So the, the five things that I talked about yesterday at the Grace Hopper Conference uh, for Women Engineers are the things that I learned for the last 28 years. First, we talked about attitude is everything. And so if you're not getting where you want or getting what you want, um, attitude's like a flat tire. Until you change it, you're not going to go anywhere. The second thing we talked about was feeling comfortable being uncomfortable and not running away from something just because you're uncomfortable, but actually embracing that. And that courage isn't the lack of, you know, fear. It means that you're able to act even though you have fear. The third thing we talked about was um, learn how to act, act as if. I talked to them about meeting the late Dr. Sally Ride, who was uh, an astronaut. And um, I asked her if she was scared when she was in the space the spacecraft, and she said, absolutely, I was scared. She said, the only way I wouldn't be scared is if I didn't understand how the systems worked. And so when I learned that Sally Ride was actually scared, then I realized I can hide my fear and act as if I'm confident the way that she did. The other thing that we talked about was controlling your own public relations, that every time you speak in the workplace, you're actually issuing a press release about yourself. And sometimes women will say so much that doesn't need to be said. So for example, I was complimenting this one engineer on her presentation to an angry customer. And she started to say, oh my God, it wasn't that good. I really didn't do a good job. There was a mistake on slide four. I don't think the customer liked it. And I just thought to myself, you know, you need to tell the truth, but not so much of it. You know, you need to just say thank you and you know, ended at that because she was really convincing me that she wasn't confident. So those are some of the things that we talked about uh, yesterday and uh, the audience was able to ask questions, etc. And I think it gave people, when they see an engineer that has worked so long and become um, somewhat successful, it gives them hope that they can be it as well. And a lot of times we hear from women, unless we can see it, you know, we don't know if we can be it. So I think hopefully I provided a little bit of that for them. Well, you know, big data is a, is a trend, and it's going to be the trend of the next decade. I mean, we, are, we haven't even begun to see the tsunami of data that hits us. Um, every two days, we create as much data in the world as the amount of data that was created up until about 2003. There is so much data there. So we talked about, um, you know, petabytes, zettabytes, yottabytes, which is like 1 to the 27, 1 with 27 zeros after it. And so what, ha what that really means is companies can have markets of one. They basically know who you are and what you like. So we're kind of going back to the small town feel when you went to a corner store and they know you and your family and they could start packing the bag. Well, with the internet and with all the big data, um, you're able to do the similar things where things come in your email of things that you like 
um, based on big data correlation. One hotel in the U.S. is experimenting with, for example, using social media to understand what kind of water you like, what, what are the things that you like, and when you check in, those things are already in your room. And the hotel is saying, I know who you are and I know what you like. And so we're going to see a lot more market sizes of one uh, as big data really takes off. There's a plethora of startups in big data. In fact, a lot of the venture capitalists in the Silicon Valley have funds that um, focus only on big data. And there's really two different types of companies that I see. One are the infrastructure companies that are trying to provide tools for everyone. Um, that would be someone like Cloudera, for example. Um, there's a lot of um, Tableau, which I think is going to go public now as a way to visualize big data. And everyone can use it, so it's kind of horizontal. And then I see a lot of vertical slices. For example, I'm on the board of an analytics company called First Rain, where it takes all the data that they can find about companies and then actually provides insight to enterprise sales forces. So there are vertical to sold to enterprise sales forces. I'm on the board of an analytics company that analyzes how much uh, small businesses are worth. So you see both the vertical and the horizontal. And I don't think, I think if this were a cricket match, it'd be like the first day. I mean, this is very, very early. Um, you know, we, we haven't yet been able to see companies be able to process, you know, zettabytes of data, you know, in real time. Yeah, you know, the Silicon Valley is a very special place. Um, if you haven't been there, every place you go, every cafe, every restaurant, people are talking about deals and talking about um, getting funding, what funding round they're on. Everyone has some experience in some startup in some way. And um, every party, that's all people talk about. So you're at a party and there's the guy that invented Java. There's someone that started uh, MySQL. Um, and I've been there at those things. And so there's so much institutional knowledge in that, I don't know how big it is in, in those square miles. And so it's, it's a long history of entrepreneurship that has produced generation after generation of families that have start, had startups, now have philanthropic funds or are doing venture capital funds. And I think it'll take a long time before another place in the world is able to replicate um, the quality of engineers you get from the local schools combined with the uh, venture capital mindset and combined with all the legal support you need, combined with all the marketing support, all the, you know, all the things you need. In fact, we have, and I don't know if you have these in India, maybe you can tell me, is we have plug and play centers. So if you're going to start a company, you don't even have to think about, and so you just go and there's desks there, there's lawyers there, there's accountants there, we have incubators. So you do a contest and whoever wins gets six months and they're able to have access to the lawyers. And the thing is, they're not just lawyers. They're lawyers that brought Yahoo public or they're the lawyers that their firm had um, been involved with Google. So they have so much knowledge. Um, I think that's what makes, makes it special. When I come to India, I definitely see uh, the excitement of the valley. Uh, a lot of very smart people that want to do very important things, solve very important problems. And I'm positive within the next decade we will see um, software companies that were started here trading on the stock exchange around the world. I mean, it, it's just inevitable. And the other trend I've seen at this conference, many of the engineers said, I've worked in the Valley for 10 years and I'm now coming back to India. Whether it's because parents are here or because they missed it. And I didn't see that 10 years ago. People were saying, I wanted to go to the United States, I want to stay there. But I saw many, many expats coming back. And I think that'll inculcate the Silicon Valley faster inside of India when people have worked in the Valley and now come back home. You know, it's funny with women. Um, so I started in 1984. And um, actually, women, there was a big push for women in the sciences as well as women in the workforce. And you could see it start to increase. And so, for example, in computer jobs, at its peak a decade ago, 37% of the workers in computer jobs, whether it was a programmer, IT, etc., were women. And now we're down to 25%. So it's 75% male now and 25% female. So there was a revolution, but now it's going in reverse. And I think that that's really um, not very helpful. And the reason is, is because diverse teams make better decisions. And when you have a team that's half men and half women, then there's this thing that the scientists call creative abrasion, where there's a richer conversation that takes place. And so the Anita Borg Institute putting on this Grace Hopper conference is really encouraging people not only to come into the sciences, but then to stay in, because 52% of women will drop out in the first 10 years. And I think a lot of it has to do with the male domination. It's just kind of, you know, it just gets really frustrating for them. 
you know, the, the piece of advice I'd give to Indian entrepreneurs that want to be global tech companies is right inside that question of global. Sometimes I see people saying, look, I'll create something here and I will sell it first in the Indian market and then I will think about, you know, going beyond the borders. You know, I think that that's, that's not the most efficient way um, to grow fast really quickly. I think that you shouldn't think of yourself as Indian, you're a global citizen, and you should be able to create something like Skype did or other companies that weren't in the U.S. as a service to others around the world and get a network effect going and a flywheel. But sometimes when I talk to any entrepreneur, he'll say, he or she will say, I'm going to start it here and then I'm going to export it out to different countries. But with the way the internet is, the interconnectivity, the way that we have social media, etc., you're a global citizen and you just happen to live in India, I wouldn't consider myself I'm, I'm going to do an Indian market because you're just, you're much better than that and you're much smarter than that.